Hey, what is up, everyone? It's Rich. All right, welcome to 10 Minutes with. Today, we're going to take a look at John Byrne. Uh, we're doing an influence chain. We've gone from Milton Kniff, Jack Kirby, Jim Steranko, Paul Galassi. Uh, we did Sal Buscema, John Romina Sr. And um, this has been an interesting, we'll call it, uh, branch of the tree. We've gone up the trunk, and uh, we're heading into the 70s now. And I know that there's a lot of huge, huge John Byrne fans. This video will not disappoint, I assure you. It's absolutely insane. I had to force myself to stop grabbing JPEGs. That's how good it was. <laughs> so anyway, let's get to this. This is a beautiful, fantastic four cover. Uh, John's used quite a few different inkers. Um, you know, Terry Austin being probably one of the most noteworthy. Jerry Ordway does a beautiful job on him, though. I've seen a few Jerry Ordway pieces. Now, Ordway is another guy. I consider Ordway a penciler, but there's a lot of these artists that came through Marvel that, again, they were utility players. If they needed to step up and do some inks, they were going to sling some ink. So this this is John Byrne and Al Milgram. This had a little bit of that Kirby flair. Um, you know, I never really, uh, I got into John Byrne stuff in the early 90s um, when I started collecting um, was the first time I was exposed to it. I've never, I've never followed John Byrne stuff aggressively, um, but uh, I've always respected it. But it's just um, one of those things where, I mean, I, I've hundreds of artists that I follow. Byrne, I think, is great. Just he was never someone that I followed super aggressively or went back. And I have a huge collection of his work just because I bought a collection off a friend of mine's. But um, I never really knew where john burns work um kind of came from and i always kind of felt that it was pretty unique to him um but then seeing the video today and kind of going through it i was like you know what these influence chains are actually helping me understand the history of comics a bit more and i, I mean i'm really impressed by what i saw today like i said i really had to kind of force myself to stop um grabbing stuff because i could have spent two hours doing this but these are all the original art they're beautiful beautiful scans um, a lot of this art has sold is his ver his artwork is incredibly collectible and expensive and um rightfully so it means a lot to a lot of people and that's why we're we're celebrating it today <laughs> lost gen i'm not even familiar with this um book had kind of a Kirby vibe. That's why I grabbed this one. It was it was tough too because the thing is, is I was tempted to grab very specific things that um, I felt um, just look kick ass, and then but I was like, I need to ground it in Kirby. So there's a little bit of both. Um, like I said, what we're trying to do right now is work our way into the 70s and 80s. I think John Byrne is a great um, bridge to all that. But we will hit Walter Simonson and Keith Giffen um, probably next. I was tempted. Oh, this was such a great piece. So this was Byrne and God, who inked it? Uh, oh, Jim McLeod. I think it's Jim McLeod or Mc McLeod. Um, I I uh, I thought this was really nice and really kind of captured that um, a, a little bit of that Silver Age sort of cover aesthetic that I always think is just so cool. What's neat, too, and I'll tell this to you, if you've never gotten into, like, Silver Age co covers in particular, I mean, it, it's, it's like, at some point, if you're a comic book fan long enough, you'll turn a corner on it, and you'll start to realize how genius those Silver Age covers are, and how cool looking they are. Um, I mean, I've spent many nights um, over the last 20 years just... You go down that rabbit hole and you're like, why is this stuff so much more cool than than stuff that you could say now is more detailed? Technically, some of the artists, they're not better, but they throw more detail on stuff. And, and there's something really powerful and just that works with some of the Silver Age stuff. But again, this is more, um, I guess they call this Bronze Age, is that right? Yeah, Golden Age, Silver Age, and then this would be Bronze Age, like 70s, 80s. And it, it is interesting, too, is is Byrne, what I was noticing is he kind of moved along, like, he always had kind of rounded shapes in his figures, but there was a point where he kind of started to get this very stylish, like, line in his stuff that got quite detailed. There's some Wolverine covers that he did, but um, yeah, he started, he started almost, like, in a way, when I see stuff like this, it reminds me of, like, Barry Windsor Smith, when Barry would ink himself, he would get this very, like, kind of swirly line, um... 
And uh, Byrne, Byrne kind of felt like he was sort of getting a little bit of that. No, I'm not saying he got it from Barry Windsor Smith. Oh, we need to do Barry Windsor Smith, too. Shoot, I forgot. We're never going to get through this influence chain. I'm giving myself one week, and we need to get it to modern age. And then we're going to start a new one. But like I said, I want to do a reverse. You guys need to recommend one modern artist, and we're going to work backwards and go to the, the seed of, of where it all came from. I think it'll be really fun. So suggestions, please. I thought this cover was really cool. Look at Terry's handwriting. Damn, it's like a damn letterer. I don't, I don't know how many of you, did any of you take drafting in like junior high school or high school? I took drafting classes in I think seventh and eighth grade and uh, it taught me how to write really nice. I mean, I already had nice handwriting, but it, it just made it even more um, better. <laughs> Sometimes they get a little sloppy with it, though. I'll be honest. And this inking style is super iconic. So many of these um, ideas carried over into Alex Garner, Scott Williams, um, many, many inkers. I mean, so many inkers use these techniques um, and have expanded on the idea. But, um, I mean, Terry Austin really, really brought um, something pretty interesting to uh, comics. There's all these mysteries about his tools. <laughs> did he did he shave down a croquel nib? Did he have some special clippers that he used? <laughs> I thought this was really cool, and this actually will be a nice segue into a Walter Simonson. We should maybe do Simonson tomorrow. I'm feeling like it's time. Time to get into some Walter Simonson. Man, this is so cool. This head needed some repairs, apparently. <laughs> like fix the cowboy's head someone in the marvel bullpen or whoever did it this is cool man there was um a full story that i saw that was in black and white i think this is um a couple of pages from it i think was this it maybe this wasn't it it's coming up soon it was it was really cool Yeah, the first work that I saw of John Byrne, which probably wouldn't have been the best entry into his stuff, was Next Men. Because I think I started collecting Hellboy, and then I saw John Byrne's name in this. And you have to understand, I didn't have any peer group when I started collecting comics. It was just something that I got into, and I didn't have, like, friends that I would chit-chat about it. And the internet wasn't really popping in 93-ish. Um, so I just kind of had to plunk my way through it. But, you know, I would if, if Mignola worked with someone, that was good enough for me and made me want to find out more about him. Um, and uh, so I, I think I bought some back issues of the next men. I was kind of like, eh, this isn't really my thing. It, at that point for me, and this is sacrilegious to say in like a John Byrne thing, but uh, the, the appeal of the image comics was, was um, so um, enticing that sometimes the older stuff wasn't. I figured I'd just clean this up. This is a beautiful, beautiful page, though. And then, honestly, I mean, the thing is, is you can credit a lot of the Image founders is they were very respectful to the guys that influenced them. You know, Jim Lee saying that he liked John Byrne was a big deal to me. If it was good enough for Jim Lee, then I needed to understand what it was that Jim saw in it. So, you know, you start to mature your own attitudes. I was young when I was collecting com when I first started collecting comics. So I was just a punk ass, um, you know, know it all kid, basically. So this says Pablo Marcos. Maybe this is a recreation. Or maybe, pa no, maybe Pablo Marcos inked. He might have inked this and then signed it in 77. My apologies if anything slips in that's not. I, I'm Usually these, like I said, if I get it off of Heritage, their descriptions are pretty accurate. And so um, I, I feel generally pretty safe about um, the way that they credit stuff because they're selling the work, so... They, they can't afford to mess up because that would piss off a buyer. This may spill a little tiny bit over, but uh, we, we, we got into this quick. I'm, I'm this like this era is where I started seeing what I would consider a little bit of like the Barry Windsor Smith thing. This is signed 1989, but this is actually I'm trying to remember what years Barry did Weapon X. Maybe someone knows, um, but uh, I would say between 89 and 91. 
These covers were gritty, though. I I have a pretty big run of the Wolverine stuff, and I, I remember just when I would see these, I would be like, man, this looks like Frank Miller Ronin, or, you know, had had a little bit of a, like, oomph to it. This was real nice. I have a great big run of his X-Men stuff. I bought a collection off a real good friend of mine, and uh, he sold me, I think, about 12 long boxes, 14 long boxes, and he was all about John Byrne. So my John Byrne collection um, was was pretty solid it still is but um some of the more low-end stuff i got rid of years ago but i have all the key key books if any of you collect comics you'll you'll appreciate this if you've ever bought a collection he was one of those guys where like he he would only have one copy of average books or even sometimes skip skip um if there was another artist on the run you know if john byrne did three issues in a row and there was an off month he wouldn't usually have it if it wasn't one that he felt was worthy but he had multiples of all the key books that was what was so awesome when he got his collection is you'd, you'd find one that was valuable and he'd have like three copies of it or five copies of it and you're just like yes <laughs> it's rare though usually they've they've uh, pruned their collection at that point but Yeah, buying collections is fun. It's hard now, though, because it's so competitive. And you've got... This was an interesting piece. So I threw this in for one particular reason. Obviously, it's got Hitler on it. But um, my thing is, is I don't honestly think that Marvel or DC would publish something like this now. In fact, I'm pretty much positive that they wouldn't. Even if the Fantastic Four and Nick Fury are, were going to kill Hitler, I don't think that this would ever make it on a cover. So it was just of note, really, because of that. Um, you know, people would be very, very uncomfortable with any kind of acknowledgement of him, but, um, you know, so this is interesting. I have three, I have three scans of this. This is the color plate. I have the, um, the original art with, um, this layover with the logos. And then I have the original art without it. So this is how the cover printed. This is the mock-up with the original art under it. So this is probably an overlay. Or even um, maybe a paste up. I'm not sure. I don't think this is actually on the original art though, because you'll see in a second. Beautiful inks on this. Really, really iconic stuff. Um, and then this. So kind of neat. Really, really interesting to see um, uh, the piece, you know, in different iterations of. Uh, whatever <laughs> whatever you call it some suggest oh covers in the background oh, okay that's neat look at him man that's cool he listed the covers that he would like th that are in the background ah okay. oh, very iconic this was nice john's great at spotting black his stuff has always got a very nice warm quality to it oh man i've got such the last piece is just gonna blow you guys away it's so awesome it sold for almost a quarter of a million too i and again i've said this on a few things it sold for that much long enough back maybe a year ago maybe a little less i honestly think it could go for more now that's how much original art has gone up in value it's like really making some moves this is cool these are very iconic books i have a big run of them that i got in someone's collection at some point or i bought them out of back issue bins but i actually think that they're really fun i like source books i like the punisher armory i like these little things where you just get like um you know kind of like the handbook on on the characters you get a you know pin up of them and then some info about them maybe the hideout you know with a cutaway where you can see the different floors of someone's you know strategy base the weapons they use can break down a character's armor you know it's really interesting I've, i i think that stuff is very very fun this is great bob layton might be another artist that we could look at at some point like we'll start another influence chain because i was thinking because since we're we're really kind of piggybacking off jack kirby essentially even though kind of started with Kniff. Mignola is really heavily influenced by Jack Kirby, but at this point, it's it's like we might as well start with the Frazetta influence in Mike's stuff, and we can touch on that he's also heavily influenced by Kirby, but Kirby's moving right now, so our, our Kirby influence is moving, but these are very, like, 
reminiscent of that, that big chunky Kirby thing and these poses are kind of like that so can definitely see even this up here to be honest you know that face is very similar to Jack Kirby's structure this is the, and you know I mentioned this in one of the first videos it may have even been in the Jack Kirby video is is that when I initially went into Crystal Planet my idea was that I was going to just try to do in, in my mind like my version of what Jack Kirby might draw a, a space book like now it doesn't look anything like Kirby to be clear so if you saw it you wouldn't recognize it but it was an abstract concept that I was kind of going for the problem was is that that um uh, of the first two or three books that i had to draw like say the first 75 pages 60 of them were normal everyday stuff and um one it's not stuff that i'm generally very comfortable drawing um i was i call it the 100 bullet scenario but the thing is is that that it's very difficult to take the Kirby style and draw two people talking in an office or walking down a hallway or, you know, some guys in his apartment. I mean, at that point, I, I really had to come up with um, a, a better sort of mental uh, game plan. So I had to I had to bail that idea pretty much two or three pages into the book, because as soon as the first little space sequence was gone, I was like, man, this definitely won't work. <laughs> but Kirby is great for this kind of material, though, you know. But yeah, another, just a regular sort of, I don't know, talking heads would be it. But, um, you know, Kirby did those types of books. But, um, you know, this is where that style really shows up. So these were interesting to me because these really show um, Jim Lee's influence um, from Byrne. Meaning that, that you can really see what Jim channeled from John Byrne on these these exciting pages. I think really, really clearly um, a lot of the poses, even the, the way that it's just laid out the inks the energy it all felt very Jim Lee like this is right out of his X-Men stuff this is cool I felt like we saw this page already but maybe this is some more this was the cover or this is the splash page of the story that we went through so this was John Byrne's story and art on this that's a lot of work to pencil ink yourself trust me I know this was cool anyone met john Byrne? i've i've never seen him at a show i don't know if he does san diego comic-con which is kind of the main one that i generally would attend but um yeah i've never seen him in person i've never met him or anything like that i mean a lot of a lot of the people i have but yeah john Byrne. i've never ever probably the closest that i came is is um legend which was frank miller arthur adams mike mignola john Byrne, jeff darrow all did a signing at San Diego Comic Con, but I don't remember John Byrne being at that table. He may have been, but um, I got to meet all those guys in one swoop, which was fucking insane. But I had just started collecting comics, so you know my my knowledge base of them was limited. It was like Frank Miller was the Sin City guy, etc. I did know I think that Jeff Darrow had done um, Hard Boiled. I think that's what it's called. I'm like. Yeah, I thought this was cool. Okay, so we're we're almost at the end here. Oh, this is nice. I like these kind of things. With the I said this in a video like within the last two weeks. I think it was the Stranko video. I like I like when artists do a caricature of themselves surrounded by the characters that they kind of um, not created but you know worked with. There's something really cool about it. I have to do that one day with the Blaster Kid universe. That would be so fun. Oh, okay, so this is the last piece. This was the one that sold for a little over $200,000. Honestly, with um, juice, they call it, but with fees and stuff like that, the guy probably paid, I don't even know, two hundred and uh, more than 200000 for sure. But, man, what a kick-ass piece. This is one of those ones, though, that I think has sold three times, so it does move around people pick it up and then they don't seem to hang on to it for some reason. I don't know why some art is like that. I mean, sometimes I guess you just got to cash it in. So, all right. I hope that that was really fun for all of you. Um, you know, like I mentioned, the people that we have on deck potentially is Barry Windsor Smith, Keith Giffen, Walter Simonson. If you have a better next step, let me know. I'm all ears. 
and hands and feet. No, um, but um, yeah, you know, whatever, whatever you think, you let me know. Ooh, standby, signed by Stan Lee, Chris Claremont, John Byrne, and Jim Shooter. They didn't get them. They didn't get them. Did Terry Austin sign it? I would think Terry Austin would be gettable. Interesting. Okay, you guys have a great day. That was really fun. Good way to start the morning. All right, I'll talk to you later. Let me get out of full screen mode. And uh, oh, hold on, we got we have three more. Let's just finish this up. No use. I took the time to grab them. These were pre-approved by Rich. <laughs> we'll go full screen mode. Bigger is better, Rich. You know that. You saw it on the TV over the weekend. Zoom, zoom, zoom. You, you'll notice that my cat isn't talking today. And thank you for the compliment on my cat. She's a good girl. Oh, here she comes. She's walking in. It's not sunny today. A lot of times when she's talking to me, she's telling me that she's enjoying the sunshine. Um, although I, I throw her in the conversation. What's up? You heard me talking about you and you came in. Um, but uh, yeah, she's just like a regular tabby cat. But she looks kind of like she might be part Siamese or Abyssinian. And she talks a lot. Like a lot, a lot. I've never had a cat that talks as much as her. But she will she will tell me that she's happy. She'll tell me that she likes music that I'm playing. It's pretty funny. <laughs> Alright, last one. Ooh. Oh yeah, this is... um. God, who was the inker on this? Shoot. I think it was Al Milgram. It was interesting, because it's a little different. I mean, it, it it's, it's in some ways... Um, almost brings like an Arthur Adams kind of vibe to his stuff, but just not the line directions are a little odd to me. Um, they're, they're not all kind of going with the forms. And so there's just like random line directions on the thing, which is a little, it's a little hard for me to get totally behind, but, um, it's flattening the forms essentially is like the line should be going with the, the different pieces of rocks. And when they're not, um, it starts to just completely like lay down flat and not look like uh, any kind of depth. So thing is tricky. I mean, I've never drawn the thing, so I can't really talk shit, but uh, I always appreciate a good thing drawing. Cause, um, he's, he's got, he's got some inherent challenges to him. So, all right, you guys have a great day. I'll talk to you later. I love you all. Thank you so much for, um, hanging out with me today. And, uh, See you tomorrow. <laughs> Bye.